everybody. Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. It's been a while since we've talked about the Israel war, but it looks like we're about to cross some important milestones. And it seems like all out war with uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon is all but certain. And uh, there, it seems like there's some key moments that are coming up. So we're going to talk about that. And then we're also going to talk about this concept of three and a half. A lot of people stick to a very literal interpretation when it comes to these periods of three and a half. I've addressed this before. I've done videos about it, but it's time to do it again uh, because a lot of people will say, no, the war has to be for three and a half years and this has to be for three and a half years and 42 months and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And that could be true, but I tend to think that these numbers are symbolic and I'll explain why. I'm going to show you what John Taylor said about three and a half. I'm going to show you what the Institute Student Manual says about three and a half. And I do tend to believe that this war is the final war. I actually feel like it's part of the final war that's been going on ever since Israel became a country. Um, here I have a spreadsheet called Timeline Israel Final War, uh, in which I wanted to show just how many people have died uh, ever since Israel became a nation. Uh, they've had a number of different wars and rebellions and skirmishes and conflicts and so on and so forth. And so... If you were writing the book of Revelation or any other book and you're looking into the future and you were trying to describe this conflict, would you call it the Arab, um, the the Israeli-Arab conflict? Would you call it the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Do you think that that's what the prophets would write in uh, the scriptures? Or do you think that they would use terms that they were familiar with? Again, we're going to talk about three and a half and what I believe that actually means and how that would apply to uh, this entire time. I've tried to update the numbers, by the way. It's kind of hard to do. There's a lot of things going on. But with this war, the Hamas... Um, the Israel-Hamas war. So far, it looks like Israel has lost, a, and this includes the initial attack on October 7th, it seems that Israel has lost about uh, 1,471 on its side between civilian and military, uh, and that includes just run-of-the-mill terrorist attacks. And then on the other side, it seems like, well, it's been reported for the Palestinians that they have lost uh, 29,514. And then Hezbollah, um, ever since they joined in, they've lost 221 of their people. So, uh, but things are escalating and let's just get into it. So we're going to talk about a couple of things. We're going to talk about preparations for war in the North with Hezbollah, which seems like it'd be a much bloodier conflict and what happened in Gaza because Hezbollah is much more, they're much better equipped. They have more firepower and I think more manpower. Um, and then we're also going to talk about Gaza and how it seems like the last big milestone is going to be reached pretty soon when Israel goes into Rafah, which is essentially the, the last main hub of, um, of Hamas fighters. So let's look at this, Times of Israel. Israeli Navy carries out extensive drills in preparation for a potential war in North. Okay. The Israeli Navy's, Navy's fleet of missile boats carried out extensive exercise, exercises over the past week, the IDF said on Friday, as the military prepares for a potential war in the North, while Israel warns that its patience for a diplomatic solution is running out. Again, I just want to remind you, <clears throat> there's all these people that want to go back home. And last I checked, there was like a, either a five or 10 kilometer buffer zone uh, along the border of Lebanon. And if you live in that buffer zone, uh, you've been evacuated and you can't return home. And Hezbollah has not stopped attacking Israel. And so to resolve it, uh, it looks, it, it increasingly looks like it's going to have to be done through military means which would probably mean uh, a full-on a full -on war and uh, another major escalation in uh, this thing that started on, on October 7th. 
And I do tend to think that things are just going to continue to escalate. We've we've seen escalations with Yemen. We've seen escalations with Iran and the militias operating in Iraq and Syria. I think things are just going to continue to escalate frank, uh, personally and frankly. All right. Israel and Hezbollah also continued to exchange cross-border fire on Friday as the Iran-backed terror group claimed to target a regional council building while the IDF said it intercepted a suspicious drone that crossed into its airspace. Later on, the drill comes amid daily attacks by Hezbollah terror group on northern Israel amid the ongoing war in the Gaza Strip. Israel has warned it can no longer tolerate Hezbollah's presence along its border following the the October 7th atrocities and has warned that uh, should a diplomatic solution not be reached, it will turn to military action to put, push Hezbollah northward. Foreign Minister Israel Katz warned Friday that Israel, quote, will not be patient much longer for a diplomatic solution in the north, <coughs> end quote. Uh, Katz shared a clip on social media from Channel 12, from a Channel 12 report Thursday evening which said Israel sent an official warning to the UN Security Council that Iran is continuing to send arms to Hezbollah in breach of UN Resolution 1701, which ended the 2006 war between Israel and Lebanon. Quote, If the dramatic intelligence information we revealed before the Security Council doesn't lead to a change, we will not hesitate to act, tweeted Katz or cuts, I don't know, after the report claimed Israel's letter to the UNSC details the types of weaponry Iran is supplying Hezbollah, as well as via which routes and on what dates. Okay. Since October 8th, so the day after the initial attack, Hezbollah-led forces have attacked Israeli communities and military posts along the border on a nearly daily basis, with the group saying it was doing so to support Gaza amid the war there. So uh, that's the thing. If that's why they're doing it, then how is there going to be a diplomatic solution? Like, how how are they going to work this out? Now, I don't know. I'm not a diplomat. I don't know all the intricacies of geopolitics, but it doesn't seem like they would just back down, uh, especially at this critical moment when Israel's about to go into Rafah, which I think is going to be another... Uh, viewed as another escalation on the the Arab side. Um, I don't know. I I don't see any way out of this, frankly. Okay. Continuing, so far the skirmishes on the border have resulted in six civilian deaths on the Israeli side, as well as the deaths of 10 IDF soldiers and reservists. There have also been several attacks from Syria without injuries. Hezbollah has named... 211 members who have been killed by Israel during the ongoing skirmishes, mostly in Lebanon, but some also in Syria. In Lebanon, another 32 operatives from other terror groups, a Lebanese soldier, and at least 30 civilians, three of whom were journalists, have been killed. French, U.S., and other officials have been attempting for weeks and months to tamp down the possibility of any escalation along Israel's northern border as it continues to fight against Hamas in Gaza. But no breakthroughs appear to be on the horizon. And that's the end of this article. And like I said, I feel like this entire thing is part of just a bigger plan by Iran. I think it has everything to do with um, swaying public opinion worldwide and getting as many people as possible um, against Israel so that Iran or whoever can deal the final blow. I think that they're intent on doing that. And we see uh, how many people have gone in support of uh, Hamas and against Israel worldwide. There's been all these, well, there's been this big political division, more polarization. We've had marches and demonstrations in support of uh, Hamas. And, um, you know, of course, there have been some on the Israeli side, but they're usually peaceful. But And I I don't think there's been as many. But on the other side, it's been a lot more violent. And um, and there have been just these big things happening all across the world showing support for Hamas. I think that 
uh, they're winning when it comes to <clears throat> uh, support against Israel. We have all these nations across the world that are hostile toward toward Israel, and it seems like it's increasing. So I think if Iran just sits back and they let Israel do these things, if they if they allow them to go into Rafa, uh, it's just going to give them in their minds more justification to do a do a direct attack or whatever their plans may be. I could be wrong. I guess we'll see. Um, seven Israel National News, Gantz, the war will continue deep in enemy territory. National Unity Leader Benny Gantz gave a statement in, in which he promised that the war would expand farther into both Hamas and Hezbollah's territory to ensure that Israelis could return home safely. And so he put out this statement in which he he let his the citizens of Israel know, we understand your predicament, you want to return home, both in the north and in the south. Uh, we're doing what we can. This isn't going to last forever. And then toward the end, he says, I promise that we will not stop fighting until you can return. We are pursuing political and military action. Hezbollah has already been pushed away from the border, and we are we are waiting for the day of reckoning in which we will need to expand our operations. I've seen so much language like this, and I've seen analysis from many people, um, you know, being interviewed with these different news outlets. And it seems like most people agree that this is going to happen. It's just a matter of time. It's not if, it's when. All right, continuing, he says, I intend to promote a plan to reinforce the North immediately, as promised. We'll, we will invest over the next few years in developing the North and South in an unprecedented manner. That is what is needed right now. We are thinking of you, residents uh, residents of the South and North. We know how strong your communities are. And along with all Israel, we will build, uh, be built, and be... What? We will build, be built, and be victorious. All right, and then... The last thing I want to cover as far as recent developments in Israel is this. This is from The Hill. Israel sets Ramadan deadline for feared Rafah invasion. Uh, Israeli officials appear to have set a deadline to invade the southern Gaza, <coughs> sorry, the, the, the southern Gaza city of Rafah, the largest refugee camp in the coastal territory for the Muslim holy day of Ramadan on March 10th. Benny Gantz a member of the Israeli War Cabinet delivered an ultimatum at a Sunday event with the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, an umbrella group for the American Jewish community. Quote, The world must know, and Hamas leaders must know, that if by Ramadan the hostages are not home, then the fighting will continue, including in Rafa, Gantz said at the event. Israel has argued it must move into Rafah, which hosts more than a million Palestinians sheltering from the war, to ensure the complete military defeat of the Palestinian militant group Hamas. So, uh, let's pause here. So anytime we're talking about civilians and um, people that are trying to get away from the war and uh, the humanitarian situation, you know, th that's always a sensitive area, right? Uh, especially with those that are against Israel. So if they were to do this, I think that it would just galvanize that side even more against Israel and probably further escalate things. But I understand I understand Israel's side. They, they have to do it. They have to get rid of Hamas completely. Hopefully they're, they'll be able to do it in a way that uh, it'll minimize, you know, casualties um, on the civilian side. But I don't know. It's just, it's, we're basically between a rock and a hard space, I think. Let's pull this up. Let's go to Institute, Institute for the Study of War. Let's see. They, they have a map there that we can look at. I wasn't thinking about this. Let's see. Uh, where is it? Oh, I don't know if they have it anymore. Let's go to Iran update because that's what they usually put it under. Yeah, so 
here you go. Here's a picture. This is as of February 21st. So these blue areas that are, are areas that are under, well, I'll just read what it says here in the legend. Uh, Israel, reported Israeli clearing operations. So basically the blue areas is where um, the IDF is. And you have Rafa down here along the border with Egypt. And uh, it's interesting because in uh, the most recent video where we talked about Jimmy Carter, uh, we came across an article that talked about how, you know, he orchestrated a priest, uh, he orchestrated a peace agreement between Israel and Egypt that's held for about 40 years, a little over 40 years, I think. But that is now in danger because Egypt has threatened to pull out of that if Israel goes into Rafa. So I don't know. This could be a big turning point in the war or a big escalation. We'll just have to wait and see. But let's continue with this. Rafa, which borders Egypt. No, no, sorry. Uh, but the looming offensive is spurring major concerns from human rights groups and emerging responders, emergency responders on the ground who warn that any invasion of Rafa could trigger a huge loss of civilian life and upend humanitarian efforts in the Gaza Strip. Rafa, which borders Egypt, is the only place where humanitarian aid is consistently entering Gaza, and Israeli military operations there could hinder what few basic necessities many Palestinian civilians have access to, including food, water, and medical aid. Quote, military operations in Rafa could lead to a slaughter in Gaza, said Martin Griffiths, the UN's emergency relief coordinator, in a statement last week. Quote, they could also... Uh, leave an already fragile humanitarian operation at death's door, end quote. So you see how this is probably going to sway people, people that are like in the middle or people that are already more friendly to, or I, I should say maybe hostile against Israel. It's it's probably just going to make uh, that worse. Uh, to address those concerns, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he ordered his military to draft a plan to evacuate civilians before the invasion. Israel's main ally, the U.S., has backed a move into Rafa, but only if a plan is created to keep civilians safe. Uh, another thing that is probably going to cause tensions to flare is I, I saw this that, let's see, um, Temple Mount Restrictions. Let's go to the news. Yeah, government ministers clash over Temple Mount restrictions. Uh, Israeli ministers clash over Temple Mount restrictions or restrictions during Ramadan. So whenever Israel does anything, <coughs> excuse me, anything with the Temple Mount, like uh, restricting access to it uh, to Muslims, or they limit the the hours in which they can go there and pray. That tends to lead to uh, conflict. And so that's just something to be aware of as well. Okay. Anyway, so that's basically it. So in the north, it seems like Israel's getting closer to attack um, Hezbollah and like expand things and maybe declare all out war on Hezbollah. It looks like they're getting toward the end or, like I said, the last main um, center or hub. Uh, during this campaign against uh, Hamas in Gaza in uh, the city of Rafah. So those are like two things, both in the north and in the south. And we're coming up on Ramadan and Passover and then the restrictions that we just talked about. So things might get interesting pretty quick. Now, really quick, uh, let's talk again about how this could potentially, this entire thing, this entire Arab-Israeli conflict uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict itself may be the final war. And you might say, well, uh, it's been longer than three and a half years. It has to be exactly three and a half years. Let's look at a few things really quick. Let's go to the Institute Student Manual for Revelation chapter 11, verses 2 through 3, 9 through 11, 42 months. Okay, the angel told John that Jerusalem would be trodden underfoot 40 and two months. 42 months is the equivalent of three and a half years. Likewise, the two witnesses mentioned in verse three would prophesy and testify of Jesus Christ for 1,260 days or approximately three and a half years. 
they would be slain and their bodies would lie in the street for three and a half days. In the scriptures, particularly in Revelation, the number three and a half often describes a limited period of tribulation during which evil forces are allowed to do their work. Since three and a half is half of seven, which symbolizes perfection and completion, it may represent imperfection and apostasy. It may also suggest that God will not allow evil to go on unchecked. Evil's time is bounded, its limits are set. And to me, that's an explanation that makes a whole lot more sense because if you were to take those numbers literally, again, you'd you'd be able to mark your calendar and be like, oh, well, time's up. We know what's going to happen next. And I don't think that that's how the second coming works. I think this is meant to say, look, there's going to be this period of time where there's conflict, there's war, there's apostasy, there's all these different things. It's just simply the symbolism of a time of evil, right? A time when Satan uh, can do his work. And I think that you could apply three and a half. You could you could apply 42 months, 1,260 days, 1,335 days, whatever, 1,290 days to this. Rather than being a literal um, time frame, a symbolic one. Uh, it seems that John Taylor agrees. If you go to uh, his discourses, there's three of them where he talks about this. So this is... John Taylor giving a discourse uh, at General Conference, October 7th, oh, pff, of all days, October 7th, 1874. Holy cow, of all days, October 7th. Okay, so what does he say? Let me zoom in. One of the prophets, in speaking of the affairs that were then to take place, said that a certain power should arise which should make war with and prevail against the saints. Now, just really quick, already some of you are like, oh yeah, that's the Antichrist. I want to remind you that a single person, like a one big bad boss Antichrist of the last days, is not part of our doctrine, and it never has been. I have a playlist called The Antichrist, where I go point by point by point by point and show you that that's not our doctrine. We do have many antichrists but there's not one the way that evangelicals uh, believe it's going to play out that has to sit in the third temple that that the that the jews build and then rule over the world for a time that's not our doctrine okay if you if you i'm not going to explain it all in the com if you put something in the comments i'm not going to address it because i already have this entire playlist that goes over it for example the man of sin Joseph Smith already said that that's happened. The man of sin has been revealed. Uh, there's also other key concepts like the mark of the beast, 666, the little horn, da 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 da, on and on and on. Just watch my playlist. But look what John Taylor says in General Conference. Said that a certain power should arise which should make war with and prevail against the saints. And then he cites Daniel 7, verse 21. Revelation 13, verse 7, and that that power should seek to change the times and the laws, and that they should be given into his hand for a time and times and the dividing of times. Very well, these things have taken place. It's already happened. What people don't understand is that these scriptures that people look at and think that it has to do with a single person antichrist it's actually talking about Satan, and it's talking about the great apostasy. This is a concept that is not part of uh, evangelical doctrine or other, or other Christian denominations. They don't have the concept of the great apostasy, and so these verses wouldn't make sense to them because it's about them. Does that make sense? It's about them. Not that every single person, is, every single evangelical, I'm not saying that they're like bad. They're just, they're lost. The world has been in a state of apostasy since the apostles were killed, priesthood keys were removed, and the authority to administer the ordinances uh, removed from the earth and lost. So all these Christian churches, even though a lot of them are good, they're in a state of apostasy. And so they wouldn't recognize this when you go to their timelines. Uh, what we call the great apostasy, they call the church age. 
So they don't even have this concept. They wouldn't read these scriptures the same that we would. All right, there's another one by John Taylor. Um, this one was, let me just find it, March 21st, 1880, delivered at the Ogden Tabernacle. Okay. And when, the, and when, okay, so, gosh, okay, here we go. And when people were flocking to John to be baptized of him, Jesus came also as a candidate for baptism. But John told him that he, John, had need to be baptized of him. But the Savior told him to suffer it to be, so then, suffer it to be, so then, to fulfill all righteousness. And he was baptized of him. Well, that dispensation continued for a long while after, and it began to decline and disappear. But there were a great many men in different parts who listened to the principles of the gospel of the Son of God. But by and by, it began to fade away, both upon the Asiatic continent and upon this continent. It was prophesied that it would, and that there should be a certain power that, okay, and that there should, and that there should a certain power arise who should seek to make war with the saints of God and that it should overcome them. And then he cites the same two uh, scriptures and his power should seek to change times and seasons and things, and they should be given into his hands until a time and times and the dividing of a time. Daniel 7, 25. These things were fulfilled. The church of God fell into darkness and the priesthood was taken from them And they had instead something in the form of a bogus priesthood and a bogus creed instead of the true principles which Jesus introduced among men. And then the final one, it's also John Taylor. Um, This was April 8th, 1875, and it was General Conference. Okay. Jesus preached the gospel. Was it right? Yes. Why did it not continue? I do not know, but it did not continue, and the prophet said it would not. And one of them prophesied that a certain power would seek to make war with the saints, and that it would prevail against them, and that they would be given into his hands until a time and times and the dividing of a time. And then other events had to transpire, and other plans and principles had to be introduced, and by and by, the time came for the restoration of the gospel. Again, and Joseph Smith was raised up, and through him the revelations of God and the priesthood were restored, the same priesthood that Jesus had, and which existed (coughs) upon the earth long before his day. Okay? So, that's why I think that when we read the scriptures and we're like, oh, the final war, it has to be this this length of time, and all this and that, uh, I don't think so. I don't. I think it's a symbol I think it's been going on. And if anything, I think things are coming to a, to a head. And this really is the end of this long conflict. And uh, I think that this probably is the war um, that's going to end it all. Gog and Magog, including the battles of Armageddon and Jerusalem, which, again, a lot of people think that they have a clear idea exactly what that's going to look like. And I'm not going to go that far. I'm just going to wait and see what happens. It may happen in a much less cinematic way than you might expect, or it may happen quicker than you might expect. So I'm not going to put any limits and say, well, second coming can't happen soon because it has to look like this. You're not a prophet. I'm not a prophet. We should stick to sources like this, like what I just read, and um, just wait and see what actually happens and not get, not get rigid in uh, our predictions about the future. Be flexible. And then again, uh, I would encourage you to watch my Antichrist playlist. Uh, this is just, for some reason, it's something that people hold on to. Some people, I think, I think just don't know. Uh, I think some people, they, they go over to these evangelical YouTube channels and uh, books and other sources, and then they just assume that we believe the same thing, but we don't with, with a number of different things. But the Antichrist is one of them. So stick to our sources, and I'll help you do that if you watch this playlist. And these are short videos, and I go through all the main points that people use to say that there's a one-person antichrist uh, that has to make his appearance before Christ can come. 
Okay, that's going to be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.